Hi there, I'm Ari with the Tech Buyers Guru, and this is episode two of our guide to assembling a high-end PC in 2019. Now, if you caught episode one, you know that we took a look at Thermaltake's A500 ATX case. I stripped it down to show you all the accessories that were included. Then I installed the Silverstone 1000 watt power supply, routed all the cables, and also showed you how to install custom fans. I took out all of the stock fans that the case came with and then installed some Thermaltake RGB fans as well as a Noctua Ultra Silent A12X25 fan. But for today we're going to put aside the case and the power supply and all the fans and we're going to be taking a close look at the heart of the system. The motherboard, the CPU, the RAM, and the solid state drives. Uh, before we get into the details here, I'd like to thank the two premier sponsors of this video series and in particular of this episode. We have Corsair, which has uh, supplied its brand new Dominator Platinum RGB RAM kit. This is a DDR4 3600 kit, 32 gigabytes. And this is a long awaited kit from Corsair combining the build quality and the uh, memory chip quality of its Dominator series with the RGB lighting of its Vengeance series. And they are actually uh, premiering a brand new RGB technology in this in this kit and we'll get into that in a, a future episode where I show you how the lighting actually works but it's brighter and and more colorful than any RGB system on the market previously. The second sponsor is Samsung that provided its 970 Pro 1 terabyte M2 PCIe drive. This is actually the fastest M.2 drive on the market that's because it's the only drive currently on the market that uses MLC flash NAND which is a faster higher endurance uh, type of NAND that's no longer used in most drives. So I'd like to thank Samsung for providing this. Um, it's not a brand new product unlike some of the other products I'll be showing you, but it's still the very best. So I'm, I'm very pleased Samsung was able to pass it along. Also in today's guide you'll be seeing uh, a Asus a Maximus 11 Hero motherboard. You'll be seeing Intel's Core i9 9900K 8 core processor, which is its best mainstream processor. And I also have a crucial uh, MX500 2.5 inch drive. And I'm, I'm mainly including that so you can see how a, a drive like that, a 2.5 inch drive, um, installs in a case. It doesn't install on the motherboard like an M.2 drive. I consider it kind of a legacy format. I'll show you that right here. Uh, a, a few years ago this would have been so cutting edge, but times are changing in the PC industry. And this is uh, probably on its last legs in terms of its design as well as, as its interface. It uses a SATA interface, which is really on its way out. But I'm going to include it so you can see how that installs in a case. So without further ado, I'm going to actually shift the camera down and give you a better look at these components and go through the steps one by one of installing the CPU, installing the solid state drive, as well as installing the RAM. I'll be back in a second. All right, I'm back. And all you're going to see in this video at this point is the motherboard and the components that are going to go into it. So first the motherboard. This is a Maximus 11 Hero from Asus. And this is more or less how you'd get it out of the box. Comes with a little a plastic cover over the processor socket and every motherboard will come with something like this. It, pr it protects the socket itself, which I'll show you, from damage during shipping. There are all sorts of little pins, 1,151 to be exact, that are in there and extremely susceptible to damage. You never want to touch them. You never want to drop anything on them. And the only thing that is going to come anywhere close to that is your CPU itself. So let's keep this closed for now so I don't accidentally damage that socket. You can see that I'm operating this lock here, and I'm going to show you that again in a moment. But let's look at the other components of the motherboard that we'll be using for this step of the process. We're also going to be installing our SSD, the 970 Pro. We're going to install it in one of the two M2 slots. Now you can't see them on this board because they're covered by heat sinks, which is what you'll see in many high-end motherboards in 2019. They are hidden underneath these covers and underneath, it, and underneath there you'll find a slot and then a uh, perhaps another set of screws. We'll have to see what's under there when we get there, but I just want you to know that that's where this is going to go, in one of these two slots. I also have my four memory sticks 
lined up here. That'll be my third step. I'll put those into the four slots here. And there are some tips and tricks I have in terms of getting memory to seat correctly, particularly DDR4 memory, which is much harder to insert into a motherboard than previous standards like DDR3 and DDR2. All right, on to the CPU installation. Here I have my Intel Core i9-9900K. Now from my point of view, this is actually the most challenging and stressful part of building a PC. Because Intel's socket is very fragile, it's actually pretty easy to damage it during the installation. There are 1,151 pins, as I mentioned, underneath this lid. If just one of those is knocked out of place, your CPU may not function. So we need to be very careful at this stage. I'm going to put the CPU down so I don't actually drop it into the socket while I'm handling the lid. To unlock, I press down on the metal bar and lift it out of the way. I then am able to swing the lid up. Notice that the black plastic lid remains in place. It will pop off once we lock the CPU down. Next, I have to determine the orientation of the CPU. You might think that, well, the word should be right side up. It's actually not always true. So what you should do is look for the indentations on the CPU. There's tiny little indentations on either side that fit into tabs in the socket. The next step is to very, very carefully lower the CPU into position. I recommend that you fit that indentation into a tab on either side, on one side or the other, feel it set in place, and then lower the CPU down. Now, if you do that correctly, you won't damage the pins underneath. But if you do it askew or drop the CPU accidentally, you actually could damage those pins. The next step is to lower the lid underneath the locking bolt, which again, you do not actually need a screwdriver to undo that. And now I'm, going, I'm actually going to lock the CPU down. For a lot of people, this is the most stressful part of building a PC because you feel so much tension on this lock, you think you must be crushing your CPU, but you're not. I'm going to lower down this locking bar. The plastic lid will eventually pop off. The plastic lid popped off. I locked the bar underneath the catch there. I remove this, save it for later, and my CPU is installed. Now, you might think, how do we know that it works? Well, I've done this enough times to know that that probably didn't crush the CPU, although it felt like it was doing that. So you just have to have faith that as long as you lowered that CPU into position very, very slowly and carefully, you didn't ruin the CPU. Now, we've got that in place. Now that the socket is actually covered by the CPU, it's very hard to damage. So I can move on, work on my motherboard without worrying about the socket. The next thing I'm going to do is install this 970 Pro SSD. But before I do, I want to show you something interesting about the way that M2 sockets slots are designed. Let me remove the cover on this number one slot, and then I'll, recover, I'll, I'll remove the cover on number two. By the way, you do need a special screwdriver. This is not a number two screwdriver. It's a, it's a essentially, well, it's a number, it's a number zero screwdriver. It's a very fine tip screwdriver. Uh, I recommend actually just getting a jeweler's uh, screwdriver set if you can't find a number zero somewhere on its own. If you try to unscrew anything relating to an M2 drive with a standard number two uh, screwdriver, you'll strip the screws. So I've removed, this is the heat sink cover. There's a thermal tape on one side here, okay? That's not to be removed. Uh, if I had just removed, taken this out of the box, this actually would probably have a plastic kind of a, a, a cover over it for shipping. That does get removed, but the tape itself is not like glue that you have to remove. This is actually part of the thermal uh, solution here. I'll put this down so it doesn't, that tape doesn't pick up any dust. And then I'm gonna remove the other cover. Again, very small screws, and they actually are they are actually often applied with a, a Loctite formula, like a blue Loctite, to lock them in. So you do have to use quite a bit of force, which is challenging with a small screwdriver. Don't let that think. Don't let that convince you to try a really big screwdriver here. You will strip these screws out. So you're just going to have to use a small screwdriver and, and work at it to, to break that thread lock if there is some. I'm going to pull this off. Okay, again, that has thermal tape applied. Now, 
these sockets are actually designed differently, and I'm going to show you a close-up here of what I mean. In the first socket, we have no additional screw. So actually, the, the screw that goes through this lid actually holds the M2 drive down. Here we actually have a screw. So that's a different design. Asus is using two different designs of slots on the same motherboard, which is a little bit confusing. You have to remove this screw if you're going to install an SSD here. I'm actually going to do it by hand because I've already loosened it. And be careful not to lose these screws. Often the motherboards don't come with extras. The other thing I want to show you, and I, I have to really zoom up close here, is a special legend on each socket. Let's see if I can show you what that says. It says PCIe X4. That means for a PCIe drive like the 970 Pro, it's rated at a full X4 speed. For SATA drives, it says X, which means it will not function. You cannot put a SATA drive in this slot. Okay, and then it does say that it conforms to Intel's RST standard. Now up here I have another slot. Let's look at the legend here. PCIe X4 standard, full speed. For SATA drives, we have a V or a check mark. That means it does support SATA drives. And again, it's, it, it supports Intel's RST standard. So why is it that we have two sockets that support different M2 drives. Well, let me show you. Here I have two M.2 drives. For all intents and purposes, they look identical other than color and labeling. But actually, if you look very carefully, you'll see that there's an extra notch in this drive. This is actually a SATA drive. It's a Samsung 850 Evo. This is a PCI, PCIe drive. It has only one notch in its connector. SATA, PCIe. These are not interchangeable. Even though they both go into an M2 slot, some M2 slots will not support this standard. All M2 slots will support this standard. We've had a lot of viewers and readers get confused about this and say they buy a SATA drive like this 850 Evo from Samsung and they put it into a slot that's only rated for PCIe drives and then their system won't boot or recognize the drive. You do have to be careful about this. Take a look in your manual or, or look at the legend that's printed on your motherboard if there is one, to make sure that you're installing a SATA M.2 drive into the right slot. Again, with PCIe drives like this 970 Pro we're using, any, PC, any M.2 slot will support it. All right, now that we have that clarification out of the way, we can go ahead and install our 970 Pro. As I mentioned, we can put it in either slot. They're both rated at X4 speed for PCIe drives, which is what you want to know. Now, they both also have these nice heat sinks. One's a little bit longer because that slot actually supports, this, uh, this slot will actually support a, a, a much longer standard of M.2 drives, the um, 110 millimeter standard, but essentially no drives use that standard. This is an 80 millimeter drive, and that's the standard that most modern drives use. All right, so let's see. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It really doesn't matter where I put it. But for this purpose, just because it's a little closer to you, I'll put it in here. Now, it does slide into this connector, and then it sits kind of awkwardly askew. And you may wonder, what am I supposed to do? Can I push down on it? Well, it's spring-loaded, so I do indeed push down on this drive. And then I have to get my little screw, because this particular slot does have a separate screw here. This is a tiny little screw, very hard to handle going to probably take me a few tries to get it. Let's see if my, my screwdriver is just barely magnetized, so it may be able to hold this little screw. Yes, it is. That is such a helpful oops, attribute for a screwdriver, especially with these tiny screws. But this always takes a few tries. We're talking about a, a small screw hole and a very small screw. And at the same time, I'm having to hold down the SSD with one of my hands. Okay, I think I got it. All right, and, and now I've got this secured. Now, a lot of motherboards actually just run, your, run the SSD just like that, and that's fine. For a really high-performance SSD like the 970 Pro, heat buildup is an issue. So then we do want to install this heatsink. It's more or less optional, but I'm going to go ahead and do it.
Now, as I push down on this, that thermal tape is actually going to adhere to my solid state drive. So I could feel that the solid state drive was making contact with that thermal tape. I'm going to put the screws in. These are a little bit bigger than the one that secures the, uh, the solid state drive to the slot. So these are a little bit easier. This doesn't have to be too tight. Remember, it's just pressing down that thermal tape onto the solid state drive. The solid state drive is already secured in the motherboard. All right. A little bit more. There we go. It's feeling a, okay. Good. Secure. Now, I'm going to leave this empty for now and put this cover back on. I'll be back in a second. All right, I'm back. My 970 Pro is installed. My CPU is installed. My heat sinks are back in place on the M2, M2 slots. Um, and we're good to go in terms of storage. Note that a lot of motherboards have one slot and some, some motherboards they actually have three slots. Um, and like I said, these are gonna become the new standard. And that's because PCI drives can't use, say, a SATA cable like an old-fashioned 2.5 or 3.5 inch drive. They require this interface on the motherboard. And manufacturers are coming with, up with all sorts of solutions like caddies that fit multiple SSDs into, say, uh, a PCI slot. We'll see what manufacturers do, but I promise you that in a decade there will be no hard drives being attached by cables. With that said, for this tutorial, I am going to show you how to install a 2.5 inch drive, and I'll get back to that in a second. Of course, we're going to have to do it inside the case, so it takes some juggling. Before we get to the 2.5 inch drive, I'm going to install the RAM. Again, this is Corsair's Dominator Platinum RGB. This has true metal heat sinks. Trust me when I say these are very hefty. I think they're made of aluminum. And, uh, and they're quite attractive. They're going to be even more attractive when the lights come on once we boot up the system. But the important thing here is to note, and I'll give you a close-up of this, that these are notched to go in just one way. As you can see here, the notch in the RAM is actually not in the dead center of the, of the stick. It's offset slightly. And therefore, of course, the notches in the slots are also offset slightly. So it appears that they are slightly offset to the bottom of the slot. So when we install RAM, we have to be careful not to try to jam it in without the notch lining up with this tab in here. Another thing I should mention is, depending on how many sticks of RAM you use, you have to choose your slots wisely. In fact, right here in very small letters, we see primary, primary. That's not just random a random logo on there. What that means is those are your primary RAM slots. So if you only have two sticks of RAM, you should be using the two primary RAM slots. So that's really helpful of ASUS to add that. Not all motherboards will indicate that. It's always the second and fourth RAM slot. That gives you dual channel operation because they're on separate channels. If you, for instance, plugged in your two modules into the first and second RAM slot, you'd lose du dual channel operation. I should also note that you won't get dual channel operation if you have just one stick of RAM. So that's never recommended by the Tech Buyers Guru. Let's go ahead and install our RAM. As I said, we have four sticks. So we'll do it starting with slot number one. I check that my notch and my tab line up. They do. And I push down until I hear the click of this locking tab. Okay, I'm going to switch over to the original view here so you can see me install the other three sticks. I should again emphasize that DDR4 actually has a fairly snug socket. A lot of readers and viewers of the Tech Buyers Guru have come to me saying, hey, my, my system won't boot, I installed my RAM, there's something wrong with it, etc., etc. Well, often the, the very first problem I tell them to look for is a RAM stick that isn't fully inserted. I'll show you what I mean. Again, I check for my tab and notch line, being lined up. I had that wrong, so luckily I didn't press down on it. Now, if I just press down on one side, I may think that this is locked in, but actually this side is sticking up. 
and I can't actually press it down. So I think, hey, I'm done. It doesn't go any further, right? Well, that's because I actually put my RAM in a little bit askew. I really have to work to put it in straight down and then press, press down on both sides. I heard both sides snap. Actually, as I, as I look at this, I see that this stick wasn't actually fully inserted. If I, had in, if I had tried to boot this system with that RAM stick just a millimeter up, it wouldn't have booted. I would have had a failure to boot and I would have thought, my system's dead, it's never going to work. Trust me, a lot of people have come to me and said, my system's dead, it's dead on arrival, it's all junk, I want to return it. It's because one of these sticks wasn't fully inserted and you just saw I had that very problem occur. Let's go with the next stick. Again, very firmly on both ends. I hear a snap on both ends. I note that they're lined up. That one's in as well. Fourth stick. A very snug socket. I have to press hard. They're all lined up. I see that they, they all appear to be fully inserted. I check my locks. My RAM is inserted. That is the number one cause of a failure to boot. It's not a failed motherboard or bad RAM or a bad CPU or even a busted socket. It's that someone has failed to insert these RAM sticks, just one of them, all the way. Even if two or three of these are fully inserted, your system will not boot if one of those RAM sticks is not fully inserted. So I hope I emphasized that enough there. Okay, so you know what? Our motherboard is ready. And I'd love to say that, hey, next step is cable it up and away we go. But like I said, I'm going to show you how to install a 2.5 inch drive. And unfortunately, I can't install this in my motherboard, right? There's nowhere that it goes. What this uses is a legacy cable. We've got a SATA cable here, nothing special about it. I guess this is a SATA 3 or SATA 6 gigabit or whatever it's rated for. It doesn't really matter too much. Every SATA cable that's been released in the past 10 years supports SATA solid state drives. So we need to choose one of the SATA ports. It doesn't really matter too much which one you choose, but there is one problem that you should note. If you're running a SATA M.2 drive in the one slot that supported it, recall that this slot supports an M.2 drive. It will disable one of my SATA ports. I have to look into, into the manual to know exactly which one that is. I couldn't tell you, and it will differ for every motherboard out there. But I want to emphasize, this is another thing that a lot of readers and viewers have come to me saying, my SATA drive won't, isn't recognized. It's dead. I need to return it. Half the time it's because they've overlapped the SATA interface with two SATA drives on the same channel. And it's really hard to anticipate that. You have to look in the manual and say, this M.2 slot disables a SATA port 4 if you have a SATA drive in it. It's all kind of confusing. It's kind of like a puzzle. That's why I really don't love SATA drives, and it's one of the reasons they're kind of on their way out. But like I said, I'm going to use one of these ports, and it doesn't matter which one I use because I have no SATA drives uh, in my M.2 slots. So I don't have to worry about it. I'm just going to use, let's see, I'll just use the one down here, okay? It doesn't really matter which one I use, but I just chose that because, because it was the closest to my hand. It really doesn't matter. All right, so I've got that SATA cable in there, and the next step, of course, is to install the motherboard into the chassis and then install the solid state drive into the chassis as well. I'll be back in a second to show you how we do that. All right, I'm back. I've got the motherboard in my hand. I've got the case laid out on my table. I'm going to do the best to show you each step here. It's a little bit hard since now we are working inside a case that is a little bit crowded inside, but we'll see what we can do. First thing I'll note is that this motherboard includes a, a neat feature, which I've seen on a lot of new high-end boards this year, which is a built-in uh, I.O. cover. A lot of older motherboards would have a uh, kind of a, a metal piece that you'd press in to the back of the case, and it was kind of awkward and sometimes wouldn't fit and would be hard to use. So uh, it's a really nice trend to see that motherboards in 2019 
are including the built-in I.O. cover. So I don't have to fuss with that. I don't have to struggle with it. Now I'm going to turn the motherboard around and drop it in. But before I do, I've got to make sure that I have standoffs in my case. I see that these are pre-installed. A standard ATX motherboard requires nine, and I see nine. So they're all installed. If you don't see the standoffs that raise the motherboard off the back panel, you have to install them. All right, so I see one right here. I see one right here. I see all nine, so we're good. Now I gotta move these cables out of the way. I, I pre-cabled this case in the previous episode, but at this point the cables are kind of in the way. So I've gotta move them out of the way. Now I'm gonna drop this carefully into the case, lining up those holes, the holes on the motherboard with the standoffs. Now I did notice as soon as I put this in that I did have a little bit more of an offset than I would have liked. In other words, uh, the back of this I.O. panel was, was not fitting quite perfectly in with the thermal tape case. This is something I've heard about some of the ASUS motherboards and their pre-installed I.O. covers. Um, I've actually used this motherboard in a separate case and it worked fine. So this is kind of another technology mismatch, these integrated I.O. shields may not be fully compatible with the cases on the market. And this is just something that you have to work with. So I have to put a little bit more pressure on the motherboard, pushing it back, and then I'll affix the screws. Now, the screws are always going to be pretty small. They're going to come with your case. You'll have to look in the manual to determine which ones are the ones you're supposed to use. Um, I've already determined which screws I'm going to be using for this uh, thermal tank case, so I'm going to start affixing the screws now. Again, there are nine holes that I need to affix. I won't do them all on camera, but I'll do a few so you see. There's going to be three in a row against the back panel here. Then there'll be three kind of in the middle of the board, and then there'll be three on the far side of the board. There we go. All right, next up is attaching cables. Here we have a top-down look at the motherboard. I'm just gonna go around clockwise from the top, installing the cables that I have pre-routed. First is my CPU power cable or EPS cable. I've got a, an eight pin and then a four pin. As I mentioned in the previous video, the cables are actually designed to be split four and four. And I have two of them here, so I've got, I could power a total of 16 pins. I'm only using 12 in this motherboard. So I'll take four from this cable and install it in the four socket. Snap it down. That one's in. And I'll take the other. Got to actually twist it around here. Sometimes you kind of have to wrestle with these to get them in the right position. I'm actually going to do it for, I'll, I'll split them because it's a little easier to handle four at a time. So I've got half of that cable in, I'll put in the other half. All right, I got my CPU power cables installed and I've got kind of one dangling. This is the one we're not going to be using, so I'll tuck it away down below. All right, next up we have the big 24 pin motherboard cable. Now, Silverstone, the Silverstone power supply I'm using has a split cable here because some very old motherboards use a 20 pin standard. Well, in this case, we have a 24 pin, so I have to use both halves of these. And I also have to twist it around because of the orientation of this 24 pin header. So it requires a little wrestling.
This is a lot easier to do with two hands, but I'm going to do it with one because I'm holding the camera here. Okay, snapped in. I got both pieces of that 24 pin cable in, secured. This is my PCI power cable. That's for my video card. Don't need it yet. Don't have a video card installed yet. Moving on, we have, oh yes, we have our HD audio and we have a USB. These actually are going to be routed down below the motherboard, so I'm going to go down here. HD audio is always at the far end, the lower left-hand corner. I'll pull that through and install it. Okay. USB 2.0, I see some USB 2.0 headers here. Make sure I have the cables, the uh, the pins align the right way. I see my nine here. I got to line it up so it, the nine holes fit up with the nine pins. Done. Okay. Now, we also have some fans. Now, this is coming from my Thermaltake fans. They're on a uh, splitter. They're a three-way splitter. And I also have this fan from the front. This is my Noctua fan. I see a bunch of fan headers here. I can use any of them. I'm just going to install, let's see, this says chassis fan two here. This one says water pump. doesn't really matter too much if I use that for fans. So let's get these two fan PWM connectors connected. Believe it or not, I actually just saw this fan move, and I don't think it was just me shaking the case. There was probably a little capacitance, a little bit of charge in that cable when I attached it to the motherboard. It actually spun that fan. All right. Um, the last thing is the front panel connectors, which are really annoying because they're so, so tiny. These little things. Luckily, Asus uh, supplies a, a, a little adapter that makes it easier. So I'm going to show you that little adapter here, right? This makes it a lot easier because then you can you can kind of hold this up, attach all the connectors at once, and then connect it to your motherboard. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'll be back in a second. Okay, I have my front panel connectors connected to this little Q connector or whatever Asus calls it. I'm not really sure. They all have different names for it. Uh, Asus... ASRock and Gigabyte all have their own solutions for this. As far as I know, MSI still does not have any adapter like this, which makes it a real pain to attach these front panel connectors to an MSI motherboard. But anyway, you can see that there's some that say plus minus, and help, helpfully they are labeled on the cables as well. See the LEDs have a plus minus. I think the reset switch and the power switch actually don't require a plus or minus indicator. So I just plug those in so you could see the labels. Now we put it in over here. This lower right hand corner is where we're going to see that. Line up the nine pins and it's in. All right, now the last cable we have to do with to deal with this at this step is actually the SATA cable. I removed it previously um, while I was installing the motherboard, but I have it right over here. All right, here's the back of the motherboard. I'm gonna be installing my solid state drive over here. The case came with this caddy. I need to attach to the solid state drive. There are actually multiple ways to attach the solid state drive to the caddy. Solid state drive has four screws on the bottom, uh, screw holes, and four screw holes on the sides. Thermaltech actually supplied some nice rubber grommets so that you can install your solid state drive using the side holes. And what that allows you to do is see the label. Now you might think that that's not that important, but a lot of people who are a little bit brand conscious won't want this arrangement, where if I use the bottom holes, 
I'd see this label. And of course, this case has a glass panel. So this label versus, you know, the branded label. Well, some people would probably prefer the branded label. So I'm going to get the screws. This is actually the only bag of screws that Thermaltake provided where the screws are actually labeled used for 2.5 inch solid state drive. So I install or I seat the solid state drive into the rubber grommets and then I'll affix the screws. As I noted these are special screws just for this application. I actually I really do think that's, uh, that they did this specifically for the aesthetics. So I'll screw it down because like I said you you could install it using the traditional screws through the, the bottom of the drive. One thing that I'm always concerned about with solid state drive mounting systems and cases is that oftentimes they actually try to flat mount the solid state drive like right against a panel. I've seen this in a lot of NZXT cases. And the problem with that is that the SATA cable itself is actually fairly bulky, particularly the SATA power cable, which I'll show you in a second. And that means that often you may be able to lay your solid state drive flat against the surface, but then you can't insert a cable. That's pretty annoying once you get to that, uh, that uh, stage of the game and you realize you have to stick your solid state drive somewhere else. So I've got this all tightened it up. Not that a solid state drive is really susceptible to vibration since there are no moving parts. But at least it keeps it in place and cushions it. So I attach it to my case, screw it in, and then we'll attempt to attach the power and data cables. Okay, my solid state drive is in place. Yes, these cables, these motherboard cables are, are not the most attractive things, but uh, as I mentioned in the last video, one of them is actually shorter than the other, and so it can't be routed through the back. It's a little bit tight. Well, I guess I can notch it around here. Actually, once I get these cables here, it'll probably be in the way. So I've got the SATA cable. That's the data cable. Then I need a power cable. This is the one that really can get in the way. If you're trying to flat mount this drive right against the surface, this is not a flat cable. Well, it's not a flat connector. It's actually pretty bulky. Let's see if it'll fit. Yes, it fits. So, no problem with Thermaltake's uh, surface mounting solid state drive system. All good. Our solid state drive is in place. All right, we're done with this stage of the build process, and that means we're done with this episode. We have our motherboard installed with the CPU in the socket, the solid state drive in the M.2 slot. We've got our memory installed. We've got everything cabled up. All that's really left in terms of hardware is to install our liquid CPU cooler which will go up in the roof of the case as well as our video card. We're going to be doing those two steps in the next video. Until then, I'm Ari from the Tech Buyers Guru and if you like this video and you want to see more, please like and subscribe and I'll catch you next time.